vital departments in Douglas County is the records department and joining me today I have the pleasure the distinct pleasure of having Miss Aubrey Britt of the records department thank you I appreciate you having me thank you so much for being here you know when I joined Douglas County Board of Commissioners uh, little did I know how extremely valuable your department is and valuable for not just the Board of Commissioners and the government, but also for the public, the general public, you know, in terms of open records. But before I go further into that, tell me about the Records Department and its purpose, please. Well, the Records Department coordinates the storage, maintenance, and availability of records to the public and to the judicial and administrative departments within the county. So our primary function in our records management program is to make sure that the records that are needed are available for the right people at the right time whenever they are needed at the lowest possible cost. Wow. What are the legal implications of managing records? Well, the retention of records is actually regulated by law. So the records department adheres to the standards uh, dictated by the Georgia Archives. They actually update those standards twice a year, and we also attend training with the Georgia Records Association to make sure that we are up to date on the best preservation methods and retention guidelines. And with the open records aspect of the records department, open records guidelines are dictated by the Georgia Records Act and open records law. So those uh, work in conjunction to help us know when we need to respond, how we need to respond, and what records are open to the public. So we make sure that um, with open records requests, if we don't meet the deadlines, we could face civil or criminal penalties, which we obviously want to avoid. So we um, make sure that we provide the records that are available and restrict information that could be negative, such as people's social security numbers and phone numbers and things of that nature. Mrs. Bird, you've got you've to share with me. When I was in school, I had no idea there was a position like this available for a career track. I mean, if someone wants to get involved, and, and, and do this kind of work, what, what do you recommend for them? Well, I'll go ahead and tell you, when I started with the county, I also did not know that this position existed. <laughs> um, I kind of stumbled upon it. Fortunately, um, it, it ended up being something that I do actually love and I feel passionately about. Um, my degree is actually in English, and I graduated from the University of Georgia. Um, I worked with Rebecca Abair when I came to the county, and she was a historian. She, she has a master's degree in history. Um, so those two degrees work closely together in relation to records management because, you know, all of the records we maintain have historical value with the county. They go back all the way to the 1880s. Wow. Wow. How does the records department influence day-to-day -day operations in the county, which you alluded to a little bit? Well, the records department, since we do maintain judicial records, a lot of the records that are needed for court on a day-to-day -day basis are maintained in archives. So each day we come in, we check to see which case files may be needed or which administrative records may be needed, and we coordinate to pull those records from their locations and provide them to the appropriate departments and individuals, and then they use them in the courts and let us know when they're finished with them. We bring them back and put them in their appropriate locations so that we will be able to pull them again if they're needed. And from an open record standpoint, day-to-day -day operations, primarily with the public, if you're considering purchasing a house, for example, mm -hmm. and you want to know if there are any code violations, building permit issues, any previous fires, any information that may help you make a more informed decision about whether or not to purchase that house, you can submit an open records request and we will give you what information we have available to help you on that end. So how could people submit an open <coughs> records request, for example? How do you normally receive them? Well, we prefer to receive them either in writing or via email so that we have written down what it is that you're wanting. You can email me. My email address is abrit at co.douglas.ga.us or you can email openrecords at co.douglas.ga.us. 
or you can do it via phone, um, via mail. We are open to any method of receiving records. It's just easier for us if you write down your request to make sure that we're giving you exactly what it is that you're looking for. So I'm going to ask you again because I know our viewers probably uh, didn't have that pen ready or have their phone ready to Absolutely. type in. So what's that email address again? Okay, you can email me directly at abrit at co.douglas.ga.us or open records at co.douglas.ga.us. And I know it's a long email address, but <laughs> you can also call me if you need to submit a records request via phone. Um, that number is 770-920-7287. Wow, that's great. This is like, tell me, this is <coughs> your first time uh, being on a show, one of our programs, isn't it? It is. I can feel my leg shaking, actually, <laughs> just <laughs> randomly while we're on that subject. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't I, show up. Oh, <laughs> not at all. But this is great because it's such, it's so invaluable um, information that's critical for people to know about, you know. And I think I was honestly thrilled that you accepted our invitation to come on um, because it's so important. I mean, you know, people need to know how hard you work. Well, thank and, you. and and that's you know constantly and it's pretty much you're, you're the key behind the department isn't that correct well Which i am the department head over the records department but you know they say you never work a day in your life if you enjoy what you do and one of the benefits of the records department is there are so many areas that you wouldn't know about unless you actually worked in the records department where we are never bored so we have since we service both the public and the county we have court records financial records tax records you know all of the different um, fields so that we can always, if we're working on something and we get bored mm -hmm. with it, we can refocus for a little while. And all of the things are equally important, but it gives us a wide ver range of things that we can work on to um, keep it interesting. Speaking of records, what's <coughs> the oldest record in the archive there? That's an excellent question. Um, with the county, as soon as the county was established, one of the first things that they do is make sure that they have a tax system set up so our and a court system. Our oldest records are our tax records, and we have it criminal and civil case files from the first cases in the county. Criminal and, and civil. civil. Yes. So with our tax records, you would think that that'd be really boring to read. But I've had the opportunity to go through some of those. We wow. have the original books from the 1880s. Which from 1880s? From the 1880s. We, we, they're very fragile, obviously, because yeah. they're 200 years old. Um, but um, the original records, they have very interesting information. In the past, in the late 1800s, if uh, the financial atmosphere was a lot different then than it is now. So if someone didn't have the resources to financially pay for the taxes that they owed, they would work on a barter system. So rather than paying cash, they would say, okay, I'm going to trade this livestock against the money that I owe for taxes. And that was a legally acceptable form of payment during the late 1800s. Wow. So, and with our criminal and civil case files, the first civil case in Douglas County was a land dispute, which you still see land disputes now. Right. Um, the first criminal case in Douglas County was actually for public intoxication in the late 1880s. <laughs> so, uh, sadly, that was not an uncommon really? charge in the late 1800s wow. in Douglas County. But it's very interesting when you're reading about it. Um, in those early cases, mm -hmm. we have case one for civil cases and case one for the criminal side. Those are on handwritten parchment paper. So this very uh, elaborate, scrawled calligraphy um, it's sometimes very difficult to read, but it's really interesting how they um, documented those court cases and the taxes in that time frame. You mentioned how fragile, you know, some of the documents are. How do we preserve those records? Well, we, we take several methods to, just, to preserve them. For the early records, such as the Tax Digest, um, plat books, things of that nature, a lot of those records are microfilmed and are available through the Clerk of Superior Court. So we do encourage individuals to try to go to those sources first, simply because the first plat book, in addition to being incredibly fragile, it's a 30-pound book that's about <laughs> this wide and that, <laughs> that tall. So, I mean, it's a really heavy um, very large book, um, but the pages in it are also from the inception of the county, so they're, they're fragile. We try to make sure that we access those as rarely as possible, mm -hmm. but they are open to the public. So if you go to the Clerk of Superior Court and the microfilm has a dark copy or you're not able to read it, then we'll make it available um, in person at the Records Department. <coughs> but we also work to identify imaging projects, and with the help of the Board of Commissioner's Office and their approval, we were able to purchase an imaging software which has allowed us to 
um, migrate over 181 gigabytes of data that we've imaged since the year 2000 mm. and to make that accessible digitally rather than for the original copies, which not only makes it quicker to search, but it also helps us to preserve the original paper copies. Um, and then another aspect of making sure that we're preserving records is knowing when to get rid of them. So some of the records that we maintain, they, we, again, we follow the retention guidelines set forth by the Georgia Archives, but they also tell us when we can get rid of stuff. So there are some records, financial records, for example, which have a retention of only five years. Code enforcement records have a retention of three years. Okay. But then our civil and our criminal cases are permanent. So we, in order to be able to continue to maintain those per permanent cases, we have to get rid of some of the information that is no longer needed, is not useful anymore. Gotcha. You know, information is the key, and it, it's, you know, you are literally like an informational highway. And on a highway, you have various cars, and for you, with those various cars, you're in a fast lane. I mean, you even speak fast. You I even do. <laughs> I do. I told you to slow me down <laughs> if I start speaking so, too quickly. So, so well, <laughs> but it's good. It's good. So, so let's say, you know, but that's the information highway because we're getting volumes of information, you know, in all sorts of ways. I mean, I guess, you know, I mean, what ways are you having to keep records, you know, you don't get paper anymore, right? I mean, a lot of we things. We do actually oh, keep paper. Do? Yes. Um, okay. The Georgia Archives recently um, changed the law so that oh, digital okay. records can become the new original. In the past, there were certain uh, guidelines that said, hey, if you have a paper copy and you scan it, you still yeah. have to maintain the paper copy. And f for now, they've actually changed it to where the digital can become the original. We in Douglas County have actually opted for some records to still maintain the paper copy as well as the digital copy. It never okay. hurts to have that additional backup. Mm -hmm. um, one for historical purposes and two just in case we although all of our data is backed up on multiple servers and we try to make sure that it is very well protected in the event that there was ever some massive data error yeah. all of our permanent records we still maintain those originals so that we would have access to them which is incredibly important if you're looking for old tax records or you're trying to prove your property information things that you know you would need to permanently have access to we want to make sure that we protect that as well as possible and when you say protect you're, you're in a secured area isn't that correct we are in a very secure area. Nondescript secured area. Yes, we um, th we actually moved in 2013 okay. to a centralized record center when the jail was built on Earl Dealey Boulevard. They vacated the old jail on Church Street, so we we were able to move all of the records in there. So it is absolutely secure. Wow. There is no way to get into that building um, without the appropriate clearance. Why should anyone care about the records department? It is very easy to undervalue what we do in the records department until you need records and you can't get them. So for our records department now, we have 14,070 locations that have over 600,000 entries for different case files, financial information, uh, for a number of different departments within the county. For the um, open record side of things, we respond to 800 plus open record requests per year. We deliver 2,000 plus case files for court every year with our imaging projects that we're going to continue working on. We image 50,000 documents per year for access just to make those available to the public and to make sure that we can have them digitally preserved just in the event that the paper copies ever right. are harmed. Um, so we, there are a lot of functions that we do that are in the background. We coordinate with departments to help them organize and know when they need to purge records and help them to set up systems to where if they need records on their end, they, they're able to locate them quickly and efficiently. So I mean, it, again, our department, we operate in the background and it's really easy until you need us um, to overlook what it is that we do. How long have you been in the department there? I started in 2010 under Becky Abair, and she actually left Douglas County to go and run Alabama archives. So she went from running just our county <laughs> to running an entire state. state. Yes, and wow. when she originally started in Douglas County, the records department was new. Um, they didn't have a system necessarily set up to catalog boxes and inventory everything. So one of the first things that she did was do an inventory and see exactly what we had, start to work to figure out how can we organize it, um, and make it to where we don't have overlap. So, you know, if there's a document that you need, we have one location where it should be and not 10 locations where it might be, uh, which is imperative when we have over 14,000 locations. Um, and she, I have to say, she did an incredible job. I would pit our records department against any other in the state. And I, we've uh, been, again, to the records 
uh, the Georgia Records Association training conferences and we've coordinated with other counties and they've come and toured us as a model facility to try to set up their own records department. So I'm really proud of what it is that we've done and that's, what we've built. That's great to know and uh, you seem to hold her in such high esteem she as is a role incredible. model. Yes, absolutely. Wow. Credit to her. What is the Georgia Open Records Act, which you've alluded to, but specifically so we can share for our viewers sure. what the Georgia Open Records Act is? Yes, uh, the Georgia Open Records Act is a set of guidelines and statutes that dictate what records are open, what meetings are open. Um, it gives us guidelines on what records should be provided, how they should be provided, what charges should be assessed, and also what information should be restricted. So, you know, whenever we have a request, it helps us to identify not only if the records are open, but if we can't release them, it helps requesters understand why we can't release them. So for example, medical information is restricted. Um, so if you request a document that is has exemptions based on medical restrictions, we will tell you we've provided everything that is open per law, but we've restricted the medical information on it and we would give you that statute so that if you needed to, you could go and review the statute and if you had any objections, you could come back and we could work to see what actually is open. Wow. I have to ask this question because you are absolutely one of, no, you know what, not even one. I will go as far as to say you, in my dealings with everyone in county government, is the most organized person that not have I only dealt with in a county, <laughs> but in my career. You are the most organized person, and I am so happy and pleased that I could always count on you uh, in helping me become organized with the information I deal with in the public. How do you keep these thousands and thousands of records organized in the records department? Well, we, we have systems for everything. Okay. So with, for example, the 14,000 boxes that we have and the 600,000 plus entries, all of that is on an access database. So we coordinate with departments. We tell them, if you're going to transfer records to us, this is how we need it to be done. We make sure that we follow the Georgia Archives retention schedules. So we organize records by record series title, um, first by department, then by record series title, which helps us keep track of how long it should be maintained. Um, we attend the training with the Georgia Records Association, and we try to keep abreast of any changes, either in retention or preservation policies. Um, it, and honestly, I mean, it's... To many, it may not be interesting, but again, the passion for the work and the, just being able to enjoy it and see all the different aspects and never being bored really helps to stay with it. Now, in my personal life, I am not organized. I can tell you, <laughs> yeah, as soon as that. I leave work, it's just a free for all. <laughs> but there are kids involved. But <laughs> okay. at work, it makes it. That's the one area in which I can say, okay, I have control over mm -hmm. this. You know, and it's being able to say, I know exactly where something is going to be. There's gratification in being able to trace back the last known location of a file. So in, it, not to say it's never happened. If something is ever misplaced, we have steps in place to make sure that at the very least we know what comes in, what goes out, when it comes back to us, who sent it to us. We keep track of open records requests in accordance with open records law. They're maintained for three years. So if you come to me and you need a request, we're able to reference, okay, any request that we have received by name, by the type of request, what department it was from. And I've just found that Again, working with Becky Abear, she mm -hmm. taught me everything that I know when it comes to organization. And if you think I'm organized, you should meet her. Wow. Um, but yes, just, just finding the best way to catalog information so that it is searchable when you actually need it um, makes a huge difference in your day-to-day -day operation. You, you know, I think from experience now, once you have your system set up and you start implementing the systems and organizing things, yes. it, and to be able to go, when someone asks you a question and you're able to say, I know exactly where I'm going to get that, there's a feeling of accomplishment and gratification and a lack of panic totally. when you know where things are located. It, it minimizes chaos yes. and provides such peace. It's indescribable. I mean, just to... Oof, it, it really is to know where where information is. Well, I think in working with the departments, when I first started with the county, you know, there's a grace period. Mm -hmm. You have to get to know the people that you're working with and they have to get to know you. And I think, you know, when I first started, we had, I had a number of departments and through the years we've built a trust. And I think I, I'm very blessed and very lucky that I enjoy working with the people that I work with and even working with the public. We have people who request 
records regularly. So, I, you know, I've built a relationship with them where they know and understand I'm willing to give you any records that are open. I have no reason not to. I think transparency is incredibly important. And if, you know, everything is done the way that it should be done, there's no reason to hide anything. And so we endeavor as a county to make sure that we follow all the laws and guidelines and make sure that we are as transparent as possible. And I think that builds a trust, not just with the departments and interdepartmentally, but also with the public. And, you know, speaking of that, you do receive uh, a lot of requests constantly from not just the general public, but from the media, various media organizations as well, right? We do. And, you know, we're always happy to coordinate with them as well because that's a way to be transparent on a broader spectrum. When we can coordinate with the media and give them information that is factual, it also kind of helps to assuage all of the assumptions that can be prevalent when people don't have all of the information. Right, right, exactly. The records department, thousands and thousands of records you're responsible for in managing as the department head there. How many people are responsible? How many people in your department staff-wise? Talk about that, please. Well, we have two. Two people. Just two? Just two people Just in the department. Just two. Yes. Um, we've tried for a number of years to get more than two, um, <laughs> but financial restrictions, we, we have... We use community service workers for some projects um, with, when people are willing to volunteer their time with the county. And some people, uh, we had a lady, um, Elaine Steele, I'm going to call her out, she'll appreciate it, uh, who actually came and transcribed the original deed book and criminal docket books. And they're all, again, they're written in calligraphy and they're very difficult to read, but she's a historian who works with our historical society. Wow. And she volunteered her time to come and make all of the, or a lot of the, there's a lot of, uh, records. She c volunteered her time to come and transcribe that information so that it would be legible so people could do better research. Um, and we were very open to working with individuals from the public who actually have a have an interest in preserving the records. But we have the Electronic Records and Information Coordinator and that position is responsible for the 14,070 locations that currently exist. Mm. Within the next few months we will be adding an additional 4,800 spaces. Um, currently we have three quadrants in the Records Department so we're going to be expanding into the fourth quadrant because we've almost reached capacity in the original three. Um, so she coordinates to with departments to send over boxes. She gets the files from the, the departments and delivers them to and picks up from. The departments coordinates community service workers and volunteers and identifies the imaging projects. And then I, on, as the records administrator, I work to process open records requests with the public. I work with department heads and individuals within the county to help them set up records organization within their department. Um, and I process open records requests and <coughs> do all of the administrative functions within the office. So tell me something. When you, as, a, as the records administrator for Douglas County, um, I understand when in a record, records administrator goes on vacation or is on leave, someone else must be dubbed that point of contact, mm -hmm. right? Is that correct? It is, yes. Is that what normally happens when? Well, I don't go on vacation very often. So okay. that, that's a minor problem. But okay. <laughs> when I do go on vacation, I either have my county phone, which okay. I can still access email uh, regularly, but also with only two people in the department, the electronic records and information coordinator, she has all of the same abilities okay. that I have. She restarted actually just a year ago. So we ease her into the different functions that she has because gotcha. there's so much just in the electronic records and mm -hmm. information coordinator position. I mean, even the title's long. Um, so <laughs> we try to make sure that she has a complete understanding of her position and also kind of start to train her on the open records law. Because again, as I mentioned before, there are civil and criminal penalties if yeah. we don't comply with open records law. So we want to make sure that people get what they need in as timely and efficiently a process as possible. Um, we're really big on making sure that people know that we will be helpful and there's no reason not to be. Um, I've t spoken with a number of individuals from the public that have commented on their interactions with other counties or other departments that are open records in general. Mm -hmm. um, and they commented on it being a complex uh, process outside of Douglas County, but our endeavor is to make it as simple for everyone as possible. When you overcomplicate it, it just, it makes it seem as if we are unapproachable and that's not the purpose of government. What is something people may not know about the records department that we haven't discussed? Well, I can tell you that they probably have no idea the number of records that we have as far as the different types. We have deed books 
uh, Tax Digest, we have Minute Books, we have um, so many different random books from <laughs> the inception of the county that are open to the public. They can come and do research. We've had a number of individuals come to do genealogical research. Um, one of the, my favorite books that we have um, is one of the books from the late 1800s again. It's when soldiers, for example, were injured in war, it would have, has their listing, whether or not they were POWs, how they passed, and basically it's a record that allows their family to research how they, um, if, if they passed or if they were found, um, and then also helps to dictate like their last will and testament, um, which now will and testament is done through probate court, but in the, back in the late 1800s when the county was first getting organized, they didn't have as many departments to help you point you in the right direction, so they kind of, it was a free-for-all. Um, so all of the books that we have are incredibly entertaining for me as an English major and historian, but they, the public has the ability to come and do that, and I think that's a resource that is um, underutilized because people don't know that it exists. And I know Judge James, when he retired, he created a forum and he spoke with individuals about doing genealogical research mm -hmm. and kind of pointed us out as a possible go-to. I think the tax records are one of the primary functions. People kind of understand better what they, where they came from and you know their, their family history yeah. when they're able to do that. But it's, it's, it, it can be interesting and it can be very helpful if you know where to look. Wow. Aubrey, this has been an extreme delight to just really take an inside look into the records department and to just have you as a guest. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you it. so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Hope you enjoyed this edition of This is Douglas County. See you next time.